Well, hello Delaware! Man, thanks for the pretty snow this morning. I mean, I wasn't really expecting that. Uh, got up this morning and looked out and it's all nice and white. So that was a nice touch. Perfect. The roads, there wasn't a problem, but we could come here and uh, it's a great day to have a meeting, right? Yeah. Okay, well, let's get into it. Uh, we're going to uh, talk about planning for success. We all want to be successful, right? And the difference between success and failure sometimes is attention to a lot of details, and that's why we have these meetings. Most of you should have gotten one of these uh, booklets here. Uh, I, I do have a limited amount, and if you didn't, I'm sorry we ran out. I will tell you right now that if you did not get one and would like to get one, email me. I have cards on me here. I'll send you a digital version if that works for you. And I would say too, I do have another meeting this afternoon up near Dover. And if this book, you'd rather have a digital version or you feel you don't really need it, just put it down back there and I'll help the people this afternoon with being able to have enough for them. I did keep a few back, but, so I'm just saying, if you could help me out, it was kind of a printer snafu, what happened there, so not to make excuses, but if you want a digital version of this, I'd be happy to send it out to you, just check with me. So we're going to talk primarily about cover crops, but that's under the umbrella of soil health. We hear about it everywhere these days. Uh, another term we're using now is regenerative agriculture. That term is kind of coming forth. It has to do with cover crops, crop rotation, and uh, you know just things, things like that. And, and as, you, as I go through my presentation today, you will hear me mention a couple times reducing our inputs. You know, there's only so much yield we can get out of our soils. You guys know that. Um, and there, there's only so much maybe inputs that we can reduce. But when we take a hard look at biology, there's opportunity there. And I'm gonna focus on that today. Um, and how we can manage to be able to leverage what is literally right under our feet. And uh, so that's just kind of a little bit of a premise. One of the things that is important to understand, and I'm gonna start here with just a few fundamental basics. It sets the stage, I will say, for success. Cover cropping is a simple concept. Everyone in this room would probably agree, yeah, cover cropping's good, right? There's no one who disagrees with that. It's a simple concept, and then why isn't everybody doing it? Is your next question. If it's so simple and so good, well, it's very complex to be successful. And those of you who have been doing it for a while, you kind of understand that, you might be getting comfortable with it. Those of you who have not dipped your toe in the water yet, so to speak, may be questioning, does it pay? And we're gonna talk about that later on. Uh, and can I get the value back? It's very complex to be successful, but the secret is management. And that's you, how you manage cover cropping is going to be the difference between success and not. So you could buy a bag of cover crop seeds, that doesn't make you a cover crop farmer. You can put a no-till colder on your planter, that doesn't make you a no-till farmer. Those of you who have been down this road, you get it, you understand it. There's a whole lot of things that need to happen. That's why we're here today to try to figure this, some, some of this stuff out. But you have to understand that, that it takes work. It takes a certain amount of education, which you're here today for, talking with your neighbors, reading magazines, looking at YouTube videos. All these things need to come together so we can learn how to do this better. You see, you can't buy soil health. You can't buy it. You can't go buy a jug of soil health. You can't buy a bag of soil health. It has to be made. And that's up to you. That's the management. So it's a combination of many things to be able to get the desired results that we're all looking for here and management. I'm gonna say that word a few more times yet today because I wanna drill it into you. It's up to you to make this work or not, and your management is the key. Just like we manage our cash crops. You don't even think about it, because you've been doing it for a while probably, and could be three or four or five or more generations. So you don't even think about it because you've kind of established 
a way to grow corn, a way to grow soybeans, a way to grow wheat. It's management. Now cover crops are still relatively new. And then when we take cover crops to the next level of beyond, shall I say it, just taking the payment. I was over in Maryland yesterday. Of course, they got a robust cover crop program. And I was challenging them. Okay, you guys kind of got it made. There's no excuse to plan them. But are you leveraging them? Are you maximizing the opportunity with the gift you've been given, so to speak? Because, yes, you can actually make money off that cover crop program that they have. I don't know what exactly you have here in this side of the line. But uh, the point of it is, regardless if you take money or you don't, you want to maximize the opportunity. Because in the future, I can pretty much assure you, and I think most of you would agree, this is the direction that agriculture is going. Do you agree with that? Soil health. That's the direction agriculture is going. And I will take this a step further. If you don't get on the bandwagon in some form or fashion, your farm may become obsolete. Because I believe there may be a time when you will have to show some sort of soil health practices on your farm, not just to satisfy the NRCS or the environmental people, but the market. The market that you're selling to is going to desire, they're going to want, because the customers, the end users, regardless if it is the lady with her four-year-old shopping in the store, choosing what she buys off the shelf, or your local Cargill or Purdue buyer of your grain, because of their market for those same people, may require some sort of soil health initiative, some sort of soil health dynamic on your farm. So I'm putting it out there, and I may talk about that a little bit more later on. Let's talk about your soils. Have you ever thought about how your soils were designed to function? We gotta know why we're growing cover crops before we understand some of the details. See, there's no cookie cutter approach. If there was, I could hand out recipes in this book and I could go home right now. There's no cookie cutter approach. You have to take the ideas in here, the ideas you hear today, the ideas you hear from your neighbors, the ideas you pick up. You have to apply them to your farm under your management system because we're all different. If I would move to Delaware, I'm from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. If I would move here, I would not be able to do everything I do. I have more hills and my soil is not as sandy as yours. So there would be differences on how I would farm. And it, what it comes down to is each individual farm, and to some degree, each individual field needs special attention to be able to maximize this. How were your soils designed to function? Uh, and understanding water infiltration, understanding water drainage. I was just in Argentina two weeks ago. Flatter than Delaware, yeah. The La Pampa region that I was at is 67 million acres. I don't know how many states of Delaware, but it's twice the size of Pennsylvania. It'd be a lot of Delawares. And I drove in Argentina 1,500 miles, and I never crossed a stream. Never crossed a stream. It's that flat. And I didn't even think about it until we were driving a couple hundred miles. And I was commenting about how flat it was, and he said, yeah, there's no streams here. And I'm like, really? Well, then I was alert to it. I never crossed the bridge with a stream. It's that flat. Their problem is the water table. They get 40 inches of rain, pretty much like you get here. And uh, 20 years ago, no-till swept through that area very rapidly. It was all prairie. And when glyphosate came along, Roundup Ready soybeans, you, know, you hear about the, the South America and all their soybeans. Well, it's true. I also verified that Argentina is 95% no-till. I saw it. It is. The reason their transition with no-till is so rapid because they were in a prairie-type system, grazing animals pretty much, and it was all set up for no-till. Quick adoption to no-till. Now their problem is when you grow soybeans, you're only taking water out three months of the year. And soybeans don't take a lot of water out, really. Their water table is rising. 
the, the precipitation events have stayed about the same. I saw the data on it, because that's, that's what they talk about meetings like this. And that's what I was there for, because now they realize, wow, we need cover crops. We need something growing in our soils year round, because this water table, start, the low spots have crept out and have gotten bigger. They've not been able to farm as much land. It's, that's their challenge. We also need to understand water management is key in understanding how cover crops function. And we need to manage them. On a dry spring, you're gonna to wanna to kill them sooner. Well, you know, I know a lot of you do have irrigation and that's great, but not all of us have irrigation because we don't wanna take the moisture away from our cover crop, from our cash crop, I mean. You have a wet spring, leave your cover crops grow. How many of you are planting green? How many of you planted green? Few of you. Okay, that's becoming more and more popular. That's a strategy that if it's wet, you can do that, and later on, I'll open up for some questions. We can discuss that a little bit more because I know there's some challenges. Did you have a question right now? Yeah, how do you predict whether it's going to be a wet or dry spring? I okay, I can't predict right now, but if it's April the first, I will know. Uh, I Is it dry? dry? I can dry out in seven days' time. Well, okay, get I get that, and that's where you need to know how your soils function. So you need to make a decision on April the first. Is it dry and there's no rain in sight? You're probably going to want to kill your cover crop. And sacrifice the, the, the usefulness of that cover crop. Correct. Is that weird? There's compromises everywhere in agriculture. All right. And and sometimes we make decisions and we're wrong because the weatherman was wrong. He still has his job. We have to deal though with a decision we make. That's farming. But yeah, you you hear what I'm saying. If it's wet, you're going to know it. Delay, delay if you can. I mean, again, it's you know I, I wasn't going to talk about the specifics of planting green. We can a little later but I can appreciate your question. You do dry out a little quicker than I do, but I don't live in the garden spot of Lancaster County. Those of you who've been to my farm know that it's very hilly and I do dry out quicker than a lot of other places do. That's an advantage in a dry, you know, in a way here. Uh, but you see what I'm saying? Understanding how your soil was designed to function. I'm promoting this book by John Stitka. Any of you heard about this book? The Soil Owner's Manual. Have you read it? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. I've never read this guy, but it's really, it really captures a lot of what I'm saying here to help you understand the dynamics of soil, the biology of the soil, in a very readable manner. There's no excuse not to read this book. It's not a scientific journal. It's not a list of all kinds of trials and research and everything. It's just straightforward, I call it farmer-friendly discussion. Soil Owner's Manual, I think it's 12 bucks on Amazon. That's what it was when I got it. Um, you can order it right now from your phones if you want. I don't care. Uh, but anyway, how, th this is what he, what he talks about. And, and I mention this because all of us with our combines and our tractors have an owner's manual, right? And we reference that once in a while when we need to. And we, we collectively in agriculture, pretty much have not paid attention to how soil functions. Rather, when we have a problem, we go to our nearest supplier or whatever and say, what can I do to kill that insect? What can I do to control that weed or kill that weed? And you know, it's more about what am I gonna kill today than it is how can I bring more life back into my farm? How can I utilize the soil's functionality to be able to maybe build up to the point where I don't need as many inputs? And I'm gonna get into that a little bit more, but it's all based on this statement right here. Your soils in Delaware were formed by multiple species and had living roots in soil at all times. When humanity showed up here, Delaware was green. If humanity would leave today, and after the snow would melt, Delaware would be green. That's why we have weeds. Nature wants to cover itself because that's the way soil was designed to function. How many of you have seen nitrogen deficiencies in a woods? No. Okay, you have? No, you haven't? If you've seen it, it's very rare. How can trees possibly grow? How can plants, shrubs, brush possibly grow without any applied nitrogen? Did you ever think of that? Now. If we would apply nitrogen, they could maybe grow more. But my point is, 
Nature can grow. Nature can grow plants in a way that doesn't need any amendments. And my point is not that we all go back to foraging for berries and nuts. I'm not interested in that. What I am interested in is this principle. Because we can address some of that. Cover crops is an easy answer. Now we can have living roots and even more mixed species because it's a little difficult to grow multiple cash crop species at once. It's not difficult to grow multiple species of cover crops at once. We just have to plan how to arrange it because, you know, once you get into the middle end of October, cereal rye is about the only thing you can plant. And I would suggest, I would challenge you in the context of the big picture, where agriculture is going, like it or not, where the public thinks we should go. Not that we do everything the public says that they think we should do. We have to give them a dose of reality once in a while. But there's opportunities out there if you want it. And what I'm saying by this is how can we have this different perspective on how we farm? And a lot of it has to do with cover crops. Can answer this question right here. Keeping the soil covered. Soil is meant to be covered. How can we continue to do that? And I know you guys have been doing a, a relatively good job, I would say. Um, but we always can improve, right? When you think about the reason the moldboard plow was so successful, when, when John Deere invented the self-scouring steel moldboard plow, that allowed farmers to farm more land, produce more feed for, more food, feed, more food for people and feed for their animals. They could do more. They could, they could meet the needs of producing food. What happened in the 1930s? Dust Bowl. All because of that method of farming. That was a wake-up call that we're still reacting to these days. There are still dust storms, probably not so much around here in the east, but they're still, they still fight that. There are still people being killed from dust storms in the last several years. I watched this kind of stuff. I, ha I saved the articles. There were two people killed in Illinois two years ago. There was one person in Oklahoma, one per I think a person in Nebraska last year killed because of blowing dust. Come on. It's 2019. That should not happen. Um, and, and my point is, what we are doing, what we have learned, our progress in agriculture, I feel is good, uh, but what will we be talking about five years from now? What will we be talking about 10? What will we be talking about next year? And, and you have to, I mean, you all understand this culture that we're in today, things are moving quicker because we have access to so much information. That's good, um, can be bad too, I guess, but uh, in the, you, if you're gonna be viable in the future, you're gonna have to understand where the future is going. And I think that's um, something that we tend not to do a lot of as much as we should, but that's why I'm writing a book. Um, it's gonna be out in 2020, hopefully mid-year, The Future Proof Farm. Uh, subtitle, Changing Mindsets in a Changing World, and it really kind of captures what I just shared in the last couple minutes, giving you guys a heads up. And I'll give you examples of what different companies are doing now, what different companies are requiring, actually, farmers to do in order to sell to them. Uh, and I may touch on some of those exam examples later. But how does this look on our farms? Well, my farm, going back to the mid-80s, when I, when I had, that's as far back as I had comprehensive soil testing results. And um, 2015 is the last time I sampled all my soils. And I hope actually today to get the results of 2019. I just sent them in last week. I should get them back soon. I hope I'm over 6% average all my fields. And um, what I've done, I'm a long-term no-till farmer. I am testing those numbers on the top four inches. So when I started in, 20, in 1985, I was moldboard plowing at least probably every other year at that point yet. And so that top eight inches was mixed, so that's an accurate reading from then what it was. If I would test to eight inches now, and I have done that in 2015, uh, it wouldn't be quite this high. But in 2015, I did comprehensive soil testing, where I did zero to two, two to four, and four to eight. My four to eight readings were 3.9% organic matter. So I did move it down there, not quite as much as you would expect. How did I do that? 
Well, I could say the obvious is cover crops and no-till, but it's the management of that. I look at it this way, there's good no-till, there's bad no-till. There's good cover crops, there's bad cover crops. And that's not to say, you know, it's just that black and white, but no-till farming in the confluence of cover crops and a strategic plan will get you higher organic matter quicker. Now I fully understand the sandier soils around here, it's gonna be a little harder to maybe get these numbers. Um, right? I mean, it just is. I, I get that. But the point is, where are you at? Are you still losing it? What is the organic matter in the fence row in this area that was undisturbed for 100 years? Anybody know? I don't know. I'm just asking you a question. It, you, uh, it runs around Almond King County, Maryland. If you test forest soils and you test uh, old hedgerows, it runs around. It runs between three and a half. Three and a half to four and a half percent. Anybody agree or disagree with that? He's in Maryland, so he doesn't count. <laughs> Thank you, though. I don't count Maryland. Okay. <laughs> no, I guess it's joking. What, did, did you ever measure? I mean, this sounds weird, but a cemetery is a good place. They don't do much tillage in a cemetery. Once in a while, they make little holes. But you see what I'm saying? That's insightful to know. You know why? Because that is your potential. Your goal should be to get up to what your fence rows are. That's what, that's what I'm saying your goal should be. My woods and my fence rows are about 7 8%. And that's my goal. I think I can obtain it in maybe 10 years. I've been going up a point, a tenth of a point a year average. So just saying, I just put that out there for you to think about. What are you doing? What's wrong that you're de degrading your soil? Something's wrong. Yeah, we can grow crops, yeah, we can make a profit, but for long, have you thought that if humanity's still here in 100 years, what the ramifications are, what we're doing today? I think we should think about that. I'm a grandfather now. Second grandbaby coming in the next month. What about the next generations? Do we care? Or do we so zoned in to, well, did cover crops pay in 2019? Okay, they may not pay every year. Some years they pay handsomely. You gotta think of cover cropping in at least a 10 year increment, at least. If you don't have that mindset going into it, if you're just saying, well, I gotta see if they pay this year, because you don't think that way with cash crops. There are some years that cash crops don't pay, or not very much, but you go right back into them again, because you know they eventually will, right? Mindsets, how you think about this will be the difference between someone who's successful and someone who's not as successful. This is how I've changed with species back in 1982, total of seven species, six cash crops, one cover crop. And that cover crops whenever we got around to it. Last year, well this is actually two years ago, but 27 species, the soil doesn't know the difference between a cash crop and a cover crop. So diversify, I'm gonna just challenge you, diversify as much as you can your cash crops. I understand market restrictions and, or challenges, but I gotta tell you, we in agriculture have gotten a little lazy in the last couple decades. There are other markets out there, I'm here to tell you. Um, and I'll, I'll probably touch on this later. I'm trying not to grow any commodity crops. I'm a smaller farmer, I can't afford just to grow corn and beans, 300 acres, that's not gonna pay the bills. But I have been a lifelong vegetable farmer, so you know I've, I've done the vegetables and there's more opportunity there if you have the right markets and everything. But, um, and, but, but still, I'm growing cover crops for seed. You guys could do that. Actually, I have a seed cleaner coming out of North Dakota right now. Should be at my farm tomorrow or next day. I'm gonna get in and gonna clean my own cover crop seeds and sell a few to the neighbors. Any of you could do that if you want to. Uh, so you may have to do something different in order to survive, but that's, that's just the way it is in business and, and it's opportunities. So in the uh, mid-90s, I was in uh, Maryland when I was first started speaking, I was talking about no-till. And I asked the question there, very, very uh, sincerely, do cover crops pay? And Dr. Ray Weil, soil scientist, University of Maryland, a lot of you probably heard of him, came up to me afterwards, I had never seen this guy before, never heard of him before, he said, would you like to do some research on your farm 
because he said, I just got a grant to do research on cover crops. I'm like, yeah, I felt. You know, I, I found out who he was, and this guy writes the main textbooks for soil science in the U.S. colleges, and that would be really cool. So we started out in the, the mid-90s. There's, there's plots over there. I'm glad I took this picture. And started seeing differences in the soil, but it wasn't until 1999, we had a dry year, I had 28 bushel yield increase where I had cover crops the previous four years. I have never asked this question since that. Do cover crops pay every year in my farm? No. But you couldn't pay me not to plant them now because they're a key part of my, right now, I'm at the point now where I'm, re, I'm able to reduce my fertility. I, I hardly ever use insecticides. And I'm a vegetable farmer. I'm telling you, they've been there. Penn State's been there, they've been all over my farm looking. I don't need insecticides on my pumpkins. I don't put seed treatment on my corn. We can talk about that later. And you earn the right to get to this point to reduce some of these inputs. That's where you're gonna start making money. Not only that, that has opened me up to markets now. And I'm not organic, just, just so you know where I'm going here. I don't, and, and great, I know there's probably some organic people in the crowd, great. I don't have a problem with the whole overall concepts of organic. I do have a problem that it puts you in a box and some of the things that are required in organic or not allowed maybe are not in the best interest of the big picture. Tillage might be one of those things. So I'm just saying that's where I'm at. Uh, and there's a, there's a strong movement now, it's pretty much under the regenerative agricultural umbrella to be able to grow things in a way that's reducing inputs using more diversity, crop rotation, bringing animals onto the land, that's gaining traction. And I would say, um, don't ignore it. You might wanna check into some of that stuff. So that's my history. So now my goal is to have my soil covered with living roots all year round. I like this picture, it was rolled down hairy bets and rye, no-till corn planted, 15 inch rows, silage corn for my neighbor Amish, then precision planted, mixed cover crops planted back in there with a the precision planter. I love that picture because there's technology involved, but there's biology involved. And that's really cool. That's where I see we're at here. The marriage of technology and biology. That's 2019, just about to be 2020. That's where we're at right now in agriculture, these opportunities that we have before us. So my goals, diversity, diversity. I didn't say much about that yet. It might have been implied that. The trick to making some of these things work is diversity. And I understand, again, I'm, I'm very understanding that a corn soybean rotation, of course, they're bringing wheat, double crop soybeans. I understand that's the norm. I would start thinking about getting beyond that. Um, somehow, some way. And I'm not saying I have the answer. I'm just saying start thinking about that. Start talking amongst yourselves. What could you, what is the markets around here? I don't know. I don't have that answer for you today. The answer for some of these questions are right here in this room with you guys. You're going to have to figure some of this stuff out. I'm just telling you, encouraging you. I want to inspire you to be able to think along these directions here, and I think you will be rewarded. So again, lower pesticide and fertilizer use, no commodity crops. I have been growing corn. I haven't grown soybeans for two years now. Soybeans aren't that great for the soil from a soil health standpoint. They tend to, if you plant soybeans every year, you probably could hardly bring up organic matter even with cover crops. I'm uh, just saying, uh, do grow some corn for my neighbors. Pursue increased nutrient density. Oh, how many of you have heard of the term nutrient density? Heard of it? Okay, does anyone want to be brave enough to describe what nutrient density is? Go ahead. More minerals and vitamins in your crop. That's an awesome answer. So let's just take um, a sip of tea and answer his question. Um, you can use vegetables as an easy thing. I grow butternut squash. I've tested my butternut squash. My butternut squash have higher mineral content in it than the USDA standard. I tested all kinds of things on it. So when you take a bite of my squash, you're gonna get more minerals in. You know, you know what the basis of all the multivitamin companies are to sell their stuff? You know, if you really listen to their spiel, the farmers aren't putting in minerals on their field. You don't get them, you know, when you 
buy your fruits and vegetables. There's truth to that because we don't get paid for that. I, why, why, you know, why spend the money? We get paid for yield. So just so my corn is decent test weight, a great yield, maybe they test for protein and soybeans or something. By the way, in Argentina, I don't know if they, do they test for protein and soybeans here? Is that a thing? In Argentina, they do. You don't get a bonus, but you get docked. And they have found that when they have cover crops, the protein is two points higher, one to three points higher. That's an incentive right there. Not that they get a bonus, but they don't get docked. It ensures them that they don't get docked. I found that interesting because I hadn't heard of that before. So that's kind of part of what I'm saying here. This is the future, people. There's going to be more of a push to nutrient density, and it means corn as well. Because when you feed a higher nutrient-dense corn to animals, they're going to be able to gain better on less feed. It works. I, there's a little research starting to come out in that. I think this is why we need to be talking about this today, because you can't do that with corn on corn on corn, or even just a corn bean rotation. It has to have diversity in there to be able to pick this up. Yeah, you can apply stuff, you can follow your feed, and maybe you can do it, but that gets expensive. Uh, what we can do is just add some of the minerals, but then we get our biology working in the soil, it's gonna provide that, the vitamin. I'm glad you included vitamins. There's studies out there that are showing that in a very diverse system, we have higher vitamin content. That's good for us. We need vitamins, and our, we, you know, I, I, I use the analogy, if you go look, and sometime you're not in a hurry, and you're at the grocery store, Look at the ingredients of dog food. You will find more minerals in dog food listed than you will on food for human consumption. Now, I'm not saying every time, but generally speaking, and you'll see the advertisements, you know. Now, yeah, we put minerals in, and, and vitamins sometimes, in some of the food that's made, but not as much as dog food. How many of you are dairy farmers or cattle farmers? A couple. Do you have a, a nutritional uh, plan for your animals? I mean, you just feed them whatever goes off the field. Do you, do you add anything beef cattle. for beef cattle? Yeah. What do you add to the ration? Just a free choice mineral. Free choice mineral. There's a bunch of minerals in there. Why do you do that? Because your nutritionist said so. <laughs> no, is there a reason for that? What is the reason for doing that? Just to cover what deficiencies in Because, why? It might not be in the hay they're eating. It might not be in the hay, but I'm still fishing for another answer. Talk louder. To have an undiverse diet. To have a more diverse diet, keep talking. What I'm trying to get at is it's healthier for the animal, right? They're healthier. Isn't that really the bottom line? Kind of healthier animals, okay. Are we doing that for our crops? So I would argue, if our crops would have this on, you wouldn't need free choice. Now that's a way to do it, but why don't do it? Why don't we treat the cause rather than the symptom? Because there's more than just minerals, and I can't get into all the complexity of it. But uh, but I'm just saying, nutrient density. I think you're going to hear more about it. Of course, profit like the rest of us. But you can't just throw on cover crops and expect miracles. I took this picture in Hungary, and and here. Um, it's a little hard to see with the light coming in here, but you can see there's a pattern there. That's actually kind of their de facto cover crop, mustard. It doesn't, it's not a great cover crop unless you're trying to do some fumigation type properties or whatever, you're a vegetable farmer. But mustard for them is very cheap, low seeding rate, easy to put on. They had a nutrient deficiency there, probably nitrogen. My, when I was out in this field, I said, you know, it'd be great if you would have planted a mix there. I would love to see what that would look like. If there would be some legumes there, it could have helped that. That soil was in pretty, pretty bad shape. Um, so here's a case where he can say, well, I put a cover crop out there. Well, he did. That's great. But there should have been some more management with it to maximize the opportunity. That's what I'm saying uh, by this picture. So that's why we have to learn how can we maximize these opportunities in Delaware, or for those of you who came over from Maryland. You know, that's why we're here. So is your soil functioning better now than it was 20 years ago? Probably most of you are nodding your head, yeah, probably. I expect, because we've come 
long way. And I know you know the answer for this. You want it to improve. But what are you doing about that? That's my challenge. What are you doing for 20 years? What are your 20-year goals? What are your 10-year goals? Maybe you don't have any. I'm challenging you to think about it. Uh, because if you don't do it, it'll never happen. Some of the keys <clears throat> are like we're here today. Learn all you can. And there's a lot that I'm learning a lot. I continue to learn all the time. I have the privilege of traveling you know, around the world um, and just to see what other people are doing. A lot of the same problems, a lot of problems are different. And then success is the same way. They're, they're, they're different, but the bottom line, the common denominator is cover crop management, soil health management. How you do that in the context of your local uh, geography. And as I've been alluding to here, understand where the future may be going. I didn't say is going, may be going, because I don't know, you know, what all is going to take place in the next couple of years. Uh, but I know the direction it's going, and it is going into a soil health direction. It is going there. So it's time to kind of get on that. Okay, what y'all came here for, or as advertised, was um, uh, kind of going through this book. I. I put out a 10% cover crop challenge because I feel that's a realistic challenge to make. You know, um, some people might get up and say, well, you gotta grow cover crops and you gotta do this, you gotta do that. And we're not all at the same place. I don't care where you're at today. What I care about is where you're headed. Which direction are you going? And I'm suggesting 10% more acres in cover crops or if you're 100% now, which I'm sure some of you are, start some mixes or become a little bit more strategic. Use a field of short season genetics just to get them planted a little earlier. You know, I don't know where you're at. What is your 10%? I don't know. But it's 10% is why challenge. So turn to page five in your book. I think it's page five. Yep, the 10% cover crop challenge. Um, we're gonna kind of go over this. And I'm going to stop along the way for some questions. Um, and a lot of the stuff, the, the big picture stuff I have written on this first page, page five. Mindset matters. You see that down there in the middle. I kind of covered that. How you think about this sets you up for success. And that's why I went over all that. Now, uh, you'll see me say here, I have a slide, treat your cover crops like your cash crops. That is the single most important thing you can do if you, act, if you take that to heart. Uh, and then at the bottom here, because, you know, I'm a very a realist. I'm a farmer. Prepare that you may have failures or prepare to fail. And I say at least a little. And, and I say that to give you a perspective here. Don't just run out of the meeting today and make dramatic changes to what you're doing unless you really understand what you're doing. I get phone calls for people who say, Steve, I heard your talk. I love your cover crop idea. I tried it. It don't work. Okay. Well, then we have a discussion. And usually I find out why, and I try to end up the conversation to at least let them try it again. You know, maybe on a smaller scale. So only try to do a new thing that you can basically afford to lose. That's a good advice for anything in life or anything in business. Um, but also, if you never change, you know, if you never fail, you might not be trying hard enough. Just make your failures small. And I know you all know that, but I'm trying to rein in some reality here um, in, in doing it that way. Let's turn the page for the, um, the, the points I have out there. And I listed 10 points plus a bonus point, and I want to get down through them. Some strategies here to achieve your 10% challenge. First of all is determine your objectives. You can start thinking about this. What are you trying to accomplish? Just think about that a second. It could be more than one thing. Is it nitrogen or nitrate nitrogen retention? Like this time of the year, we had rain yesterday. If there's still leftover nitrates out there, your cover crop may have gotten them already and is holding them there in the roots and in the leaves. If you don't have a cover crop, it may be in the water table that'll eventually go out in the stream, that'll go in the bay. I know it's not as dramatic effect if it goes in the ocean. Are we in a bay watershed here or not? We are yet, okay. I wasn't sure where that line fell through here in Delaware, but you get my point. 
are we keeping it? And, then, and not only, I like to tell people that you keep your nutrients on your farm, the environment will take care of itself. I mean, you, you got to think that the Chesapeake Bay awareness has been a major spark plug, a major reason why there's so many cover crops around today, right? You kind of agree with me in that? And I got to admit, in the late 80s and early 90s, when I started hearing about it, I'm like, hey, I'm a farmer, leave me alone, this is what I do. Out of sight, out of mind. In 1982, when I started no-till, I did it for one reason alone. On my steep hills, I had erosion, sometimes two to three feet deep gullies that I had to close before I harvested corn. And I just thought, that just isn't right. And it was the, the aspect of the time it took to do it. <laughs> I could care less about the Chesapeake Bay. You know, that's just the way it was. We didn't care. Um, but then when I started seeing and understanding the system, getting into understanding how the soil functions and all that, I realized, oh, there's more to it here. And then we started hearing about the bay. And, uh, but like it or not, the bay awareness, even though we kind of felt it came on us from a regulatory standpoint, we're now finding out, you know what? This whole system is not a bad system, just taken as, as it is to be a, on the farm, to keep the nutrients in place, to wake up more nutrients that may have been locked up because of dead soil. All these things now we're finding out there's a benefit. So what is your goal? Maybe it's to make nitrogen using legumes. And I'm assuming not all of you have chicken manure. I understand there's a little bit of chicken manure around these parts. And maybe you don't have that, I don't know. Um, you know, or just, to keep your soil covered. Not everybody's flat around here, and even a 1 or 2% slope can have some erosion. Maybe it's to stop the erosion. I don't know. I'm not going to go over all the reasons you know. You increase organic matter. That's one thing you all want to interested in. Um, so what are you trying to accomplish? Because that's going to then determine what species you start to select, and maybe what strategies you'll employ. When is your planting date? Number two, define your planting window. And that can change from year to year weather. Um, we can start and manipulate that a little bit with genetics, short season genetics. Interseeding, I know that that doesn't work 100% of the time, but it's, an, it's a tool. It's a tool to have out there to use where you can get some of the, employ some of these things. So when we know what we're trying to accomplish, and then when we know when the planning date is, or when, we, it's, when it's approaching what it may be, we can start fine tuning what species will work, what mix of species and all that. So these are just very simple things to think about. Treat your cover crops like your cash crops. Let's say we have a, an early harvest. Now, instead of normal harvest of corn in September, I mean, I'm always amazed when we come to the beach. We used to come to the beach down to, uh, to go to Rehoboth about the, the weekend after Labor Day. And it was always kind of cool to come down here and see guys are starting to shell corn already. You know, it, and so I'm just saying that you have time to plant radishes at that point if there's still moisture in the ground. Um, but not all your corn's harvested the second week of September. But let's just say you have an early year. Now you can start thinking about other species you can hear. Are you ready for that? That's my point here today. Are you ready to maximize every opportunity that you have? And it's not the same every year. Some years are later, 2018, a little later, right? And wet. I had the worst cover crops I ever had, 2018. And I'd like to think I know what I'm doing. But I did. We just couldn't plant, it was too wet. Uh, so that's, these things happen, but are you ready to take advantage of those opportunities? That's why I hope you can leave here today with some nuggets of how to do that. Uh, number three, uh, check with NRCS or other cross-sharing programs. I understand there's some other cross-sharing programs around here. Um, so raise your hands, I think in the back is we have our NRCS friends here, right? We have a couple? Oh, they're sprinkled around, awesome. So you would know you know, Equip, CSP, I guess. What are the other programs that you have? Pardon me? That's the most of them. Okay, I don't know which ones for these watersheds. Um, um, and I, are there, are there other, can, can you just help me out here? What are other cost sharing programs that are available here in Delaware? Conservation, Conservation districts, okay. Speak loud. Other ones? Any other ones? Okay, so you have, you have opportunity out there. I like to say that if done right, you don't need any cost share, but take it, especially if you're new. It, you know, it gives you, it's an opportunity you have. 
you, we are blessed. We are blessed here in the U.S. for some of these things. When I travel, I was just in Argentina. Zero subsidies for anything. Zero. Australia, same. Zero subsidies. In Australia, the reason they're interested in cover crops, they don't have crop insurance either. No subs I mean, they can get it if they want, but there's no help like we have around here. In Australia, they were telling me, we need to build a bigger bucket. I thought I knew what they mean, but I said, what do you mean? We need to capture every drop that falls out of the sky and hold it. Soil health, cover crops, no-till. That's their crop insurance. And I will tell you, one of the biggest barriers to some of the soil health adoption has been our very own policies. I'm not beating on the NRCS now, okay. But general government policies have squashed some of this direction we need to go. They're coming around. And, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that the NRCS has done well, generally speaking, in promoting soil health and so forth. So um, that's great. But most areas of the world, a lot of them don't have any, any help out there. They're on their own. But you know what? They're doing it. What does that tell you? There's something there. But to do it, they got to do it smartly. So I'm saying take advantage of any programs you have. There's people here you can talk to today uh, in that. And, um, and uh, you know, take advantage of that. Number four, develop a cover crop establishment plan. Some of us intuitively can do that. You know, I'm not the best organized person, and I don't have everything written all out. Um, it's in my head. At least that's what I say. Uh, but for some of you, writing out a plan is not a bad idea. The next page over, you can see a sample of one. I borrowed it from a conservation district in Ohio. They said I could use it. I'll just tell you now. We may go through this a little bit later, but um, I'll just tell you that you can use. If nothing else, it'll stimulate your thinking. Um, and if you want to make copies of it, if, uh, if any of you want to use this to help your customers, if you're in consulting or whatever, feel free to use this. They, they told me I can use it, anybody can use it. It just helps guide you a little bit to think through it so you can have a, a more detailed plan in your head in it. So that's what I'm referring to there. Um, and, and I would just say, just give an example, uh, aerial seeding has been done here. Um, you know, it's consistent enough that it works enough that people are doing it. Uh, I prefer drilling, direct seeding if you can. And sometimes having a plan to follow the combine may be a little bit more sure in getting a good cover crop established. So I just lay that out there uh, for you to think about, not saying which way you should do, but to think about it. Um, any questions on developing, or any questions on the top first four points that you want clarification or would you like to add to? Is there something I may have missed? Anybody? Um, Gotta be quick here, I'm gonna move on. Okay, number five, consider adjusting your herbicide program, or at least understanding your herbicide program uh, in relation to cover crops, because there can be, there can be some issues with that. Um, because of resistant weed issues, we're going using a few more residuals now than we have before. Uh, so what, you may be surprised. You may have been planting cover crops. Well, got to use a residual to keep those mares tail down. What's that going to do to my cover crops this fall? What happens if we have a dry summer or your non-irrigated land? Is that herbicide still there? Am I going to waste my money by the, herb, by the cover crops dying or these are some questions I, wanna, I don't want you to stumble over. So just on a practical note, if you're concerned about herbicide, you can read, um, and I have a website there. I don't know if Delaware has a website like this. They might. On the more of the modern herbicides and how they affect cover crops, I'm, I'm, I'm listing Penn State because that's what I'm familiar with. They basically say, well, you apply this herbicide in soybeans, it's a uh, fairly low chance there's any issues moderate or you better be careful. That's how they put it. Because there's so many variables. Just because the book says this doesn't mean that's the way it is in your farm. So, you got to test on your farm. So you get a shovel, you go out and dig about two inches, and you go a couple of places in that field where you're going to plant your cover crop in two weeks or so, put it in a bucket or something, smooth it out, plant a few of your cover crop seeds you want to plant, water it, 
and see what they look like in 10 days. If they look pretty healthy, good chance you can plant that field and you'll be good. Follow me? Just a little trick you can do, because if you're paying for that seed, you don't want it to die. If they all die, then it's like, uh-oh, huh, maybe I shouldn't do this right now. You had a, com a comment. Yeah, um, I'm just wondering, having you found as your soils become more biologically active, that you have a quicker rate Absolutely. He said, once your soils become biologically active, you have a quicker breakdown of the herbicide. Basically, you don't have as much trouble, as many issues with this. And that is true. I like, that's in the, you earn the right category. Because, so, um, the Penn State uh, weed specialist, uh, Bill Kern, who has since retired, I interceded at when the corn was, actually it was a little beyond what I recommend now, it was like a V7, you know? I interceded cover crops in there and they grew well, it worked. And, I, and he, when he came out with his recommendation that at that time I was using a Lumax, 2.4 quarts of Lumax, kind of the standard rate. He said, well, they shouldn't have grown. And I said, well, they did. He said, what's your organic matter? I said, 6%. Oh, okay, that's why. That was his response to your point. Um, so that's why I say the true test is do your own soil assay, as they call it assessment uh, if, you have, if you're concerned about that, especially if you're new, using some of these residuals now that we need to use. Any more questions on herbicide interactions and stuff? I just don't want you to get caught on guarded and, and just a simple thing to do. Okay, number six, ensure proper setup on your cash crop planter if you're planting into cover crops. The two biggest things, well maybe there's not two, but if you're planting in cover crops, and here again there's a lot of variability, if you're planting in tall cover crops or you're planting green, can your planter handle that excessive residue? Do you have, you know, what row cleaners do you have? Well, the row cleaner's gonna clog up. You talk about a bad day, when you start planting in the row cleaners and you gotta stop and fix them and the sun's out and it's beautiful and all your neighbors are happily planting and you have to get down underneath that planter and bust your knuckles up. Been there, done that and try to clean this out. That is not fun. That's when you will say things you don't normally say around the wife and kids. Um, so, or the closing wheels, same thing. There's a lot of spoke type closing wheels and I think I have some pictures. I forget if it's in this presentation or my other one. But anyway, that, this can be a problem. Are you, is your planner set up? You wanna have these issues figured out beforehand. Uh, so, um, yeah, just, just one of the things that, I don't have pictures here to show you right away, but the closing wheels. Um, it's difficult sometimes to close a seed slot if there's a heavy root mass in there of rye or even in you know, some of the different cover crops. And so to make sure you get that seed slot closed, do you have the right equipment for that? So these are some of the questions you need to consider, especially if you're moving in to be more aggressive, planting green and things like that. That's a whole topic right there in itself, but is there any quick question that I might have brought up that you might be thinking about you want answered right now? No? Okay. Number seven, um, set up a cash crop fertility plan. This is, and again, we're getting into the details now. If you're planting corn into a cereal rye, pretty much assume that there's zero nitrate nitrogen available at that moment. We've all seen no-till fields planted in cereal rye that look yellow. Nobody wants to have that. Well, you don't have to. The, the common target is, oh, there must have been a laleopathy. I would say generally not. How many of you know what a laleopathy is? Tell us. It's when a plant creates compounds that prevent seeds from germinating. Exactly, I couldn't have said it more succinct myself. When plants create compounds that hinder germination of other seeds. I'll be a little bit more specific. Do you agree with that? Because mm -hmm. you were going to answer. But Okay. So generally, cereal rye is the one we know about. Now there's others out there. But cereal rye, once it's usually in a state of dying or termination, it will release chemicals that will suppress, inhibit, generally the germination of small seeded broadleaves which is kind of nice because Mare's Tail is one of them. 
Uh, so there is a certain element of suppression there, but the, the studies I've read and the farmers I've talked to say that generally does not affect corn. Usually it's a misdiagnosis that it's a nitrate nitrogen deficiency. Okay? So when you have cereal rye, it's doing its thing. It's taking up the available nitrogen. Not the whole nitrogen profile of that field, but the available nitrate nitrogen at that time. So having nitrogen in the furrow with your starter or very close to the seed is critical when you're doing that. Now on the flip side, if you're planting directly into hairy vetch, crimson clover, Austri Austrian winter peas, you don't need any nitrogen at planting. It's there as long as the crop grew 12 to 24 inches tall. So this is, this is what I'm saying, what is, do you understand? Now, you're gonna wanna side dress at V4 for when that corn takes off, uh, unless you wait till, to plant corn till the third week of May when the hairy batch is in bloom, where it can provide a lot of the nitrogen for the corn. Most of us don't do that, I'm not advocating that. So you can use, that's how you can strategically use less nitrogen. Now, if you have cereal rye that's terminated at boot stage, that's gonna pretty much disappear on at least a halfway decent biological active soil. It'll disappear by July and August. It, it, it's so succulent, the C to N ratio is lower. The, the microbes, the earthworms will be able to eat it up and turn it back into fertilizer. That you may get some of that back at the tail end of your corn cycle, of its needs for nitrogen. Which is not bad having a few pounds available in August to finish it off. But you need to understand how this works. Now, if you plant into cereal rye six feet tall and it's out in heads, you won't get that nitrogen back till next year. Because that stuff's probably still out in your field now today. You know, because it's, it's higher C to N. It takes a while for the, nitrate, the microbes to break it down. This is where you need to understand some of the nuances of fertility. So, and then again, let's just make this a little more complicated. When you plant mixes, what do you do? Well, part of it is you, you, you get used to it, but, you know, do some checks. We can, I could put chart after chart of fertility plans, fertility research up here but it's really what works on your farm. And what I have seen is the more biologically activity, more biological active fields that you have, the less response you get from fertilizer. What I like to say is fertilizer makes, or excuse me, cover crops make fertilizer more efficient. It's kind of loaded, but there's a lot to that. But you have to earn the right. Just because you plant a cover crop one year doesn't give you that right. It's once you're in this five, 10 years of intensity where you're gonna start getting benefits from that. So, any questions on fertility, cash crops? All these statements, all these points here could be a half hour discussion in themselves. But yes? Have you done any research on plants like uh, cash crops and corn and cover crops simultaneously? Yes, um, if I've done any research or experienced planting a cash crop like corn, and a cover crop simultaneously. Yes, and it failed. I can show you a picture. What I thought, brilliant idea from Steve, why don't we grow sun hemp? I got a 15 inch planter, uh, you know, why don't I plant corn and then the 15 inch rows plant sun hemp? Pretty good stand of cover crop. Herbicides are an issue here. I don't want to kill the sun hemp. The thinking was sun hemp is a fiber crop It'll be fully mature by the time the carnage rate harvest. That's gonna pull right down through the snapping rolls, right? Well, it wasn't bad, and I was gonna, I was gonna uh, reduce my nitrogen, because it's gonna produce nitrogen for me, for the corn, right? Theory, sounds good. Well, it, 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 yeah, it, it did uh, produce some nitrogen for the corn. The problem was, no matter how I showed the combine, no matter how I sped up and slowed down with ground speed and also snapping rolls, that stuff just cut off at the, at the snap and rolls and it went through the combine. Combines are not designed to take a lot of green material through them, in case you're wondering. Uh, so I ended up, now again, I'm a small farmer, I have a four row, uh, an old 4420, but that suits me fine. I ended up harvesting one row at a time. Now, remember what I said earlier? Make your mistakes small, two acres. 
Yeah, it took me a little extra time. But your Amish neighbors were laughing at you. They probably were. <laughs> <clears throat> you see my point? <clears throat> I tried that. There's some people messing around with that. I haven't <clears throat> figured out how to do that. What I have seen, uh, and you might ask, be asking the question, what about interceding when corn's V4? It hasn't been very consistent. It's been more consistent north of Interstate 80, New York, Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota. We think because they have more sunlight in the summer, because it's all about light getting down in there. We haven't seen the consistency of interceding working, and that's kind of what you were saying, but um, I think there could be some of that working someday, but I haven't really figured it out. Anybody else figure out how to plant corn and a cover crop together and make it pay or successful? Let us know. Um, but it, you know, I know some people are messing around with it. There's, there's different things out there, but. I tried it once, and uh, I'm not ready to try it again, at least with what I know now. So, okay, um, where are we at here? Uh, set up a ma number eight. It's up there in the top right. Set up a management or scouting plan. Uh, too often we plan it and forget it, or we, you know, whatever. And since I'm inquisitive, since I want to know what's going on, I have a four wheeler. I'm constantly driving over my farm, just looking at things, just watching, watching, observing. Some of you have crop scouts to do that. And I will just say at this stage, I'm, I'm sure there's some crop consultants here, which is awesome. If your crop consultant is not on the same page of the direction you're going with soil health, or at the very least is willing to try some stuff, if they're not, you should fire them, get someone else, like you guys that might be here. Because that's a battle. Crop consultants, you're paying them to make you money. But if they're not confident, they'll probably talk you out of some of this stuff. And maybe they should, but you know what I'm saying. There's not everything that's out there may work in your farm. But what I'm talking about is an amicable relationship with your goals, because you're in charge. So if your crop consultant is not willing to have a discussion or have a general idea where you want to go, you got to have a plan. you got to have something there, because um, uh, you're the owner. And there's, there's more and more crop consultants that are now seeing. I know a couple now that are full-time. They're specializing in soil health. And there's enough of interest out there now that some of them are able to have a full-time consulting business that's based on farmers who want to do this kind of stuff. So you might be a crop consultant out there today. You're thinking, you know what? I could really you know, be the first one, be the expert in the area. I think there's room for that now. Um, so, uh, but even so, if you don't have a consultant, you, you got to be watching this. Watch what's going on. I mean, I, I literally am out there sometimes when the corn's, you know, full height, crawling around, looking at things in the, in the field. Uh, also, I'll say another statement. If your crop consultant doesn't have a shovel in their pickup truck, maybe that's grounds for being fired as well. It's about the soil, people. Understanding, that's why I started out, understanding how the soil function is key to make this work. Um, you have to do more than just buy a bag of cover crop seeds. If you're gonna make all this stuff work, I mean, I could have a seminar here all week and still not share uh, you know, things that, that you need to know, that you want to do or whatever. Um, so uh, that's, that's uh, you know, the, the key about management, scouting is very important. Number nine, set up a termination plan. I heard someone say already, you should, have your, you should have your termination plan kind of in place before you plant. I'm talking about cover crop. And there's some truth to that. Now there's some that's relatively easy. Um, now when I mention the word annual ryegrass, what's your response? I see some giggles, he likes it. I about guarantee you there's people here who don't like it. You might want, you know, some people it's like a cuss word. It can get in your wheat, hard to get out of your wheat, and you might not be able to kill it. Annual ryegrass is an awesome cover crop. Great roots, go down, break up compaction. Uh, very little biomass to fool with, with your planter, but that's the problem. Because of that dynamic, hard to kill. And there's ways to kill it, but you gotta know what you're doing, and it's multiple things, and we can talk about that if you want to, but. Um, you know, uh, the termination plan, I kind of alluded to it earlier, uh, you know, watching the weather. We make decisions every day as farmers. 
Every day we're making decisions, particularly in planting. Do I plant today? It's a little wet, but they're calling for rain tonight. We make decisions sometimes. We gamble sometimes. That's, you know, that's just farming. And the same thing with cover crops, but is the, is the decision with cover crops, are you, are you dialed in to what a smart decision really is? Here's something for you. Never kill a cover crop that you don't be able to expect to plant into before the next rain. What can happen if you kill the cover crop and you get two inches of rain before you get it planted? Huh? Tell me. It turns to dough. It turns to dough. <laughs> now you have your soil covered, which is awesome, but it's not going to dry out very easily. And you might not get back in that field for two or three weeks, depending. That's a mistake. That's a classic mistake that some people make. And I get it. Sometimes the custom operator's there, well, while you're here, spray the whole thing. Well, you're risking, if you ever would get an unexpected rain or something, that may be hard to get back in there. So we, we talked about planting green and everything. So this is where you can manage that. And do we make perfect decisions all the time? No, but that's farming. Uh, so there's just one thing to be aware of. Uh, planting, spraying after you plant, even if, you, even if the cover crop's relatively small, the tracks of planting and everything don't seem to affect too much being able to kill the cover crop later on. Now, if you have traded corn, herbicide resistant corn, even you can let it come up. I've seen in rainy weather, people let their corn come up two leaves before they terminate it, if it's like Roundup Ready or Liberty LL Ready, whatever. You can do that if you have those traits. If you don't have those traits and it comes up, and you didn't spray it yet? Not good. I know. 2018, we had a wet spring. I had, I think it was about 18 acres, and you know, I'm trying to maximize my cover crops. We planted, and we literally had four days straight of rain. There was never a chance to go in there and burn that off, and my heart sunk. I went out and I saw my corn spearing up. Dang, it wasn't traded. <sighs> Call up nutrient ag. What are your options for post-emergent corn and killing hairy vetch, annual uh, uh, annual ryegrass, triticale, Austrian winter peas? You know my my phenomenal cocktail. Oh well, we can kill it, but it's going to cost you a lot. So we put on um, a, a Acuron, Accent. You know, we spiked it. It cost me like triple what I was expecting. Do I make mistakes? Yeah, I pushed it a little too far there. But, you know, um, I'm just saying it was only 18 acres, but still, it worked out fine. You would have never known it at the end. It worked. But, you know, learning lesson for me. And uh, so these things happen sometimes. Okay. The, the, the tenth one, become a student of cover cropping. I've, 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 I'm really, really emphasizing that here. Uh, again, that's why you're here today. Go to field days. Take advantage of that. See what's going on in the neighborhood. There's nothing better than to see what is going on in your neighborhood. Now, I have relationships with people all over the world. I learn from them, but there's some things I can't. There's no commonality, especially with climate and uh, weather and soil types and everything. But learn all you can. Be a student of cover crop. What are you doing besides showing up here today? Obviously, you're here. Uh, to do this. And then my bonus tip is, I'm sure most of you probably rent land. And that's a tough one. That's a challenge, especially if you have a landlord who's just all about the highest dollar. And they don't really care. They don't even know the benefits that you may be providing for them. So I'm going to just simply say, have a conversation with your landlord about this. See where they're at. Do, would they be willing to go to a five or ten year contract? That would be kind of nice. Because you're investing in the, the key, whenever we talk about cover crops paying, it's always entered in there, it takes time. And so if you're just on an annual cash rent, cash lease on an annual basis, man, it's, it's, it, it would be tough for me to invest a lot of money in cover crops and time, not knowing I might not get that next year. And there's some conniving farmers out there that they'll see a guy put four years investment in cover crops and they know that if they come in there and till it up, all those nutrients that are banking there will be released and they can be able to grow a phenomenal corn or bean crop. They'll outbid someone by 20 bucks and landlords will take them up on it. That happens sometimes. I've heard of this. 
So, okay, we kind of went over all these things. I know there's more, but that's some that I've listed. Any questions on this 10% challenge on these points here? Any, any questions, comments? How am I doing, Jan? Am I covering? Doing good? Awesome. Any questions? I got more. Okay, well, let's just flip the page while you're here in that cover crop management plan. And I'm not really going to go over that um, point by point. It's pretty self-explanatory. Some things apply to you or not. It, the idea of this, for some of you, you'll like to put this, print this out, or actually fill it in. For other users, it just helps you think about different things. Um, the, 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 the big problem with cover cropping is a lot of the times we don't really know what we're going to do to the last minute. See, most of you have your corn bought, maybe your soybeans bought already, right? That's pretty, you know, you're going to be planting them. We don't know what the weather's going to do. Um, and I, I don't have my cover crop seeds bought for 2020 because I want to have options. But I'm in contact with my local dealers, and I deal with more than one. Well, I grow a lot of my own cover crop seeds, and I'll just leave it at that. But in spite of that, I, I need to fill in some things. If there's, if there's a question about what may or may not happen, as you get closer to that time, minimum two weeks out, hey, you have a pallet of hairy vetch on hand. I think I'm going to be able to plant some this year. Make that call, because if you say, hey, uh, we're set up to plant this afternoon. I'm going to stop over. Can you deliver a pallet of hairy vetch? Oh, sorry, we just sold out. Oh, crap. That's what I'm talking about. Plan ahead. It's treating your cover crops like your cash crops. This, this again, you might have that window of opportunity you've been waiting five years for, and you finally got it, but you missed it then because you weren't prepared. Having this form here, you know, will have, you know, at least you've thought through it. And, you know, what, what is the seeding rate? What should the seeding rates be? You know, that's, it's going to be fine-tuned by your area here, by the time and everything. I mean, I can give you my ideas. People call me up. Uh, the classic is uh, people will call me up. Hey, uh, Steve, what, what cover crop do you think I'll sh I should plant? And I'll say, I don't know. And then they're like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, you have to tell me what your objectives are. Remember we went through that? What your objectives are, when your planning window is? Sometimes, well, how much can you spend an acre? That's another question I didn't put in here. And then how do we mix that up? Maybe the price of hairy vet seed is high this year. Maybe I should substitute crimson clover or all peas instead. All these things, that's why you want to know. Like, like let's just say um, some dealers, all they are doing is they're just a, they, they just carry seed. Very little service. And basically whatever you ask, they'll, they'll give you the answer uh, that you're trying to look for. And uh, if you want to be smart about it, I actually have a, a, a thing I do called five questions to ask your cover crop seed dealer. Like, what is the germination of that? I got once picked up some cheap cereal rye. I get home and the germination on the tag was 80%. That's pretty low for cereal rye. Oh, now I know why it was so cheap. Well, that could affect my seeding rate then. I'm going to have to plant a little bit more to get what I want. Or, wow, that's 96%. I can drop my seed rate a little bit. And if you really want to be nerdy about it or sharpen your pencil, do your own germination test. I know too much about the seed industry that I don't trust anything. I've been in it. If you really want to know, you take, when you get your seed home, this is why you want it a couple weeks ahead, do your own germination test. It's easy. Take a paper towel, just grab some seeds, put it in it, 20 to 50 seeds, sprinkle them out, put a little water over it, put them in a Ziploc bag, zip it up, throw it on your desk. Five days later, pull it open, oh, they're germinating, close it. Two days later, open up, okay, now I'm going to count the seeds that germinated and the seeds that didn't. Is it close to what the tag said? Because you know they're required to take, most states require a sample for every 20,000 pounds. Do you know how much a sample is? Like what you can hold in your hands. On 20,000 pounds, boy, that's ripe for little games. And believe me, they do it. So I'm just saying, who do you trust? One thing, and then also if you really want to fine tune things, do your own tests, do your own germinations. I don't do it all the time. I do it sometimes, uh, just, to, just to find out. So any questions on those little details? Yeah. 
that's very good advice on the commercial seed to buy also. There's been some seed. You're talking about corn and beans. Years, and, mm -hmm. You know, companies mm -hmm. have snuck a lot of junk in. Oh, well. yeah. Yes, it can happen. Um, and I don't want to spook you and, and say everybody's not doing right. Just cover oh, yeah, you're talking corn and beans. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's a, it is a good idea. It doesn't take much to do it. Like what I just told you, it's easy to do. The, the, zip, the part is the Ziploc bag because it keeps the moisture in there. And I usually make the towel just so it's, it's, it soaks up all the water it can. And I fold it over. The seeds are in between the folds, like two or three folds of a, of a, of a you know, there's paper towels you can get that you have in your kitchen. Um, so any other questions on that? Okay. This here, I think, is the foundation of it all. You heard me say it a lot. Treat your cover crops like a cash crop. If you do that, you will stand a good chance of success. Um, there's our thing we talked about here. We went over it. Any other questions as you looked over this crop management plan? Any questions you want to discuss now or comments? What is missing there? Is there anything missing? Should we have anything? Okay, a couple more things here. Oh, shoot, I got, you gotta see this. You gotta see this. I hope this works. I'm gonna back up. Good, it works. This is in my field. Two inches of pretty much pure topsoil. This is the first field I started no-till in 1982. Remember I said it was kind of stony and rocky? Uh, now you don't see any stones on the top. And that's partly because the earthworms have churned it up and left it there, decaying biomass and everything. Um, it goes with that. You might recognize someone in the middle there. I won't say who, but she's here today. Um, uh, so, so again, I like this picture because it shows mixed species cover crops. It shows the difference of the soil health. I mean, you can't really see it there, but you know, my, my point is there's a different, you, you couldn't pay me to till off that soil. That field there is well over 6% organic matter. And um, yeah, it's just, uh, it's just, it's gratifying when you see this working on your farm. It really is. Um, so some of the challenges we have out there, you know, kind of the point now where, yeah, this is great, rah, 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 yay, cover crops. Well, there's challenges. Lack of information, we still need more information. Um, I challenged the Maryland cover crop people. They should take a couple million dollars. Um, nobody needs $90 an acre to plant cover crops, I don't think. Take a couple million of their, their pot of gold, which is nice that the taxpayers are paying it. I'm not dissing that. But you put that into cover crop research, cover crop promotion, education. Because we need to learn more. There's a lot more we need to learn. Think of all the money that's spent on herbicide research um, pe all pesticide research, billions and billions of dollars versus how much is spent on soil health. Just a drop in the bucket. If we could somehow move that over there. You know, it's unfortunate. It would be nice to put soil health in a jug, wouldn't it? And charge money for it. <laughs> then there would probably be money available for researching it, but there's not. And that's a challenge we have. Lack of information. Uh, government programs, particularly zoning in on crop insurance, uh, crop insurance originally did not like cover crops. It made it hard for them to, they just were afraid of, you know, how it manipulates, maybe yields. Um, the, what, that's turning around now. Illinois, uh, Iowa in 2018, Illinois followed suit in 2019. They each state offered a $5 discount off the federal program premiums if you planted cover crops on new acres. See, I would advocate that there would be a sharing of information between the FSA, the NRCS, and the RMA. There's no reason technologically they can't do this. They know if you're in these programs, they know your yields and stuff, that if you can show you've had stable or maybe increasing yields and use cover crops, you shouldn't have to pay anything for basic cover crop, basic crop insurance. That would help people use it a little bit more. The idea is your crop insurance is more resilient soils against extreme weather. Call me a radical, but that's what I would advocate. Then you would start to see people getting serious about it. If they could prove and they could show that to have their, their that when, and, and, and trust me, there's been survey after survey going out that 
the use of cover crops will actually increase yields. Not much, but it's a little bit. And that's with experienced farmers. So it's out there. There's precedent for that. We could be doing that. Uh, peer pressure is still, it's still a factor. You know, are you, the, are you the guy in the neighborhood that, you know, you, you go to the coffee shop and they're like, well, what are you growing down there? Uh, sometimes that's positive, sometimes it's negative. Depends where you're at on that. I've heard people say they could no longer go to the coffee shop. They were ridiculed. I've heard that. That's unfortunate, but it happens sometimes. We talked about rented land. Crop consultants mentioned that. Most input suppliers, you know, as soon as you start mentioning lower use of inputs, they get a little bit nervous. Bankers, you know, can you justify to your banker why you spent $5,000 or $10,000 in cover crops when they look at that? That's a little hard to do, but you want to be prepared for that. And um, again, I have a whole talk on that as, as well. And, and again, coming back to this thing, I kind of opened up with this. We've been taught to control nature with tools. What am I going to kill today? That's been our mindset. I'm suggesting, well, how can I put more life in my farm? And uh, you know, one of the easiest ways, I think, is insecticides. That's the first thing that you can start reducing. And people agree with me on that. Uh, and, and because you're bringing back nature, you're mimicking nature, having the bugs control themselves. Now, I'm not saying I'll never use an insecticide. I will if I have to, but there has to be a pretty good reason. There's some days I'm a little nervous sometimes. I see a few, few cucumber beetles out there in my pumpkins. Eh, I'm just gonna wait another two days and see, and usually I can eat through it. You know, then you start seeing ladybugs. And uh, now, um, I can't go anywhere without talking about hemp, it seems, and you guys cornered me right away today. Someone did yesterday, I grew hemp last year. Uh, we can talk about that lunch if you want, but the amount, that is an interesting plant. It naturally resists, resists a lot of insects. But when I was harvesting it, we saw an average, I'll just give a span of six to 12 ladybugs on every single plant. Unbelievable, I've never seen anything like it before. But I'm growing it with cover crops and no-till on my system. Didn't surprise me. Pardon me? Were they getting high? No, they weren't getting high, they were CBD hen. I know we can't get away from the jokes, but that's okay. Uh, so they were healthy, <laughs> but they were there, they were there, you know, they were, for some reason, they, it was just, and that's really cool when you see that on your own farm. We need to mimic nature, we need to nurture it. You know, wherever you're at, like I said before, I don't care so much where you're at, I care about where you're going. And uh, we talked about that a lot. What are you trying to accomplish? Um, but this is where I wanna get to here. And I, I alluded to this, but who is your mentor? Who are you listening to? Now, now we're getting specific. You know, who is here today that you kind of look up to? Uh, this is Frederick Thomas, a friend of mine from France. I've been there four times. Uh, we talk regularly, like once a month. He has a farm. He also does a lot of education like I do. And even though we're somewhat similar, but, but we're still way different, um, you know, we, we kind of, in a way, in a good way, egg each other on to try new stuff. There's been some stuff I've told him that I've thought up, and he said, oh yeah, I already did that. I'm like, shoot, thought it was my idea. But anyway, who is your mentor? Ideally, it's someone in your community, same soil, same climate, um, that, that can really help you. So if you just kind of get started, and you, you notice a farmer that's doing some stuff, most of those farmers are willing to talk about it. Most of them are. I would say tie into that. If you're, if you're into consulting, if you're, um, with the NRCS or with any of the educational groups, you make it a point to rub shoulders with that farmer who is doing this stuff. There's nothing better for you to help that person, enable them to do a field day. Uh, maybe write an article on their farm. Most farmers are open to that kind of stuff. So don't waste your time on people who, in my opinion, who do, do, don't really want to do this. I know that's kind of our passion sometimes, but you all be more effective. Farmers believe farmers. And it's just the way it is. It's nothing against consultants, but farmers will believe farmers. So if you can enable that farmer who's doing this stuff in whatever way that looks like, that's gonna be your most effective method to do it. So who is your mentor? Think about it now. I had one guy come up and he goes, my mentor is YouTube. <laughs> okay, there's a lot of stuff on YouTube. You just now need to know how to sift through it. You know, what's gonna work in your farm? I watch YouTube videos from people and 
You know, we have the, the classic, well, that's great for him, but it'll never work for me. And that may be true. But what's the nugget that I can take from that? That's why I look at it. What is the nugget? What is something that I can, maybe can use on my farm? I just show you this picture here because this is um, uh, a planting at night. And we, you know, we got good lights nowadays in our equipment, GPS and everything, but I'll just say if you can plant at night in the covers like that, you got things dialed in pretty good. So get to that point where you feel that you can do it. One of the problems I had was there was some hairy vetch in there and it was catching on the planter. You know, every couple rounds you'd have to get off and you'd have to pull it off because it was getting too big, it was starting to trail. <laughs> so simply, do I say, these blankety blank cover crops are causing me a problem? No. I've been thinking, I'm thinking, okay, what if I just tie a rope across this front splitter units? And that's what I did. See that little red rope on there? And that, that bent it forward. See the hairy vetch was climbing up the rye. That bent it forward, problem solved. A few minutes of time, rope cost, doesn't cost you anything, hardly. So some of these things you're gonna, you're gonna run into once in a while. Yeah, I'm glad I have this, problems. Yeah, these spoke type closing wheels, there's a lot of them out there, they're great. But when you start into bigger covers, planting green, they start clogging up. I'll tell you what, if you have a 24 row planter like this, that's a bad day. <laughs> so you might have to get back to the shop and you know, there's only so much you can pull out by hand. Uh, and I've actually burned up bearings already doing that. It's, I just gotta keep going. It's so nice, I just gotta keep going. And I've ruined bearings already. Uh, so what do you do about that? Well, do I go back to other closing wheels? Well. You know, I um, found out that there are several companies that make deflectors. This is Yetter. Um, I think it's one of the better ones. Uh, and this is on my pumpkin planter. I have those twisted spikes there. But if you can see this here, it bolts in here and this will kick it out so it doesn't wrap. Now you gotta get it just so it's scraping here but not so much that it inhibits the turning. But if you leave an eighth of an inch gap, it'll still clog up. So these are some parts and pieces that come out. You know, when I started no-till in 1982, I don't know that there, was, there wasn't any row cleaners. I made my own. I made my own row cleaners out of closing wheels. At that time, there was no spike ones. But I devised, I welded nails onto a cast iron closing wheel. We had cast iron back in. We have so many options out there Man, I wish I would have kept that. That would be like a museum piece. Uh, but anyway, um, we have so many options out there, it's confusing sometimes. What I'm saying is, we can fix these problems. We have the stuff out there to do that. There's a lot more planting green now than, uh, I'm actually amazed. We at the, at the National No-Till Conference, I see you have a hat um, uh, from that. Um, last year in Indianapolis, were you there in Indianapolis last year? Okay, in Kentucky, yeah. So last year in Indianapolis, about a thousand people, they asked for a show of hands, now this is the no-till coverage, who's using cover crops? Well, 80% of the hands at least went up. A lot of the no-tillers using cover crops. But then the, the two leading speakers were Trey Hill, some of you know, not, not too far from here, over in Maryland, Rock Hall, Rock Hall, right? Uh, large scale farmer, and also uh, Rick Clark, from Indiana. If you ever get to hear Rick Clark speak, you'll be, he's out there, 7,000 acres transitioning to no-till organic. He's up to two to 3,000 now. Uh, I've been to his farm, I've seen it. It's not perfect, but he was the second speaker, Trey Hill, Rick Clark. They asked the question, how many have tried planting green? Out of those 1,000 farmers, roughly a third raised their hands. I was really surprised. So this is a trend, this is where we're moving. Uh, again, it require an hour to explain everything, but I would challenge you to use this as a management tool. Again, when your soil dries out in seven days, you gotta be really careful, I get that. And maybe this won't work in some years, uh, but that's, that's part of management. At least maybe try it in a field or two when you can. Um, that's, that's one thing, you're maximizing your cover crop growth, you're maximizing organic matter production. And um, another thing we're seeing, and this gets into another topic that some of you will maybe, um, maybe I'll lose my credibility a little bit. But when you start amping up the biology in your soil, you can start to begin to think about eliminating insecticides on your seed. 
Now, I'm not suggesting that's the first corn you plant that you do that with. But what we're seeing is that insecticides is killing some of our beneficial insects, particularly with slugs. Well, you don't have any slugs down here, do you? Oh, you do? Yeah, I thought I do. It can be a big problem. Uh, what has happened is we're compounding our slug problem because when that corn germinates and grows and comes up, has a seed treatment on there, neonicotinoid seed treatment, the slug will eat the corn, doesn't phase it because slugs are mollusks, they're not insects. Then you have the, our friendly carabid beetle or our friendly lightning bug larva. They'll, 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 they'll get this slug and eat it because they like them and they die because they've just ingested the neonicotinoid insecticide and then our slug population increases and we have a problem. So Penn State, John, Dr. John Tooker, look him up on the internet, Tooker, T-O-O-K-E-R, Dr. John Tooker. He's been looking at this now, I think, for seven years. Um, and we're seeing that once you get into the system, it usually takes about three years of cover crops. And without seed treatments, we're starting to see less and less slugs because we're allowing our beneficials to do the job for us, to balance out. Nature will always balance out if given a chance. Now, the tricky part is how do we grow food in that context? And I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying that's the direction we're headed. Are you with me? That's the direction we're headed. So, yeah, question. So, are, are you, I'm sorry to get you specific now. But sure, that's fine. We're at that part of the program. Um, the, the targeted insect of that seed tree, mm -hmm. or if, once you take away that seed tree, mm -hmm. are you not increasing that targeted insect? You could, and that's why you don't try it on much. And that's why I'm scouting like every two days. But I've done this for five years now, and I'm part of, you know, farmer groups that we've been looking at this, and we don't seem to have those problems as much anymore with corn rootworm and, or, and whatever you have in there. But don't do this the first year, your first year no-till. One thing I want you to hear, you earn the right to get to this point. And I'm not going to say it's going to work every time. I'm just saying it's working a lot of areas. It's working for a lot of farmers, and it's not just the east. It's the west, it's, it's Europe, same thing. I'm seeing this beginning to work, and, and I, it comes under the category, you earn the right to do this. So from a practical standpoint, most seed companies laugh at you when they say, can I get seed treatment? Can I get it without seed treatment? And they'll, they'll list this, you know, well, it's just insurance, you know, you don't know, it's cheap. It's insurance. Um, and I understand that. And they don't want to have a different brand or a different line of the same genetics. Some of the smaller regional companies will accommodate you, but you got to talk to them soon if you're interested in doing this, because they like they're they're putting seed treatment on now, and through you know, March or through January and February. It is really weird to dump in yellow seed corn into a planter. You know, I've done it all my life. It always has a color on it because it indicates there's treatment on it. But uh, I'm going to just put that out there. I want you to know what's kind of coming down the pike. And I'm not saying there'll ever be a time there'll be no seed treatments. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that that's, that's where I'm going to. Um, and I've seen, we've, I did a three-year study with Penn State University and um, a couple other farmers. And, and we, we essentially, between corn and soybeans, it was not a negative effect. It did not increase our yields. I wasn't expecting it to. Uh, but it's starting to try to, you know, bring, utilizing what we have out there for free. It's managing out there. So I know some of you think that's crazy, but that's okay. Um, some of us are doing it, and we continue. Other questions? We have, we have a couple more minutes, because I'm, I'm, I'm done with this presentation. If there's no questions, I have another presentation I can go into, but. Uh, when, <clears throat> when you're using multi-species cover crops, is there a rule of thumb on the seeding rates? Okay, um, would, would someone be able to bring up my other presentation? If you could do that, because that's exactly what I'm going to talk about. So the question was, what was your question again about mixed species and so forth? Yeah, the, the, the seeding rate. The seeding rate of a mixed species. Yeah. How do you, how do you, uh, how do you how figure do you, that out? How do you justify it? Is it going to cost me more? All those are typical questions people ask. I'll first of all say that a seeding, a mixed seeding, uh, mixed species doesn't have to cost more. 
So I'll put that out there. Or what are you trying to accomplish? I know some vegetable growers who were happy to plant $60 an acre worth of cover crop seed because they're in vegetables. I'm not gonna recommend a $60 an acre to a corn farmer. That just would not work. Um, so I'll just go through this a little bit. I'm gonna blow through some pictures here because uh, I wanna get to this discussion right here. Use the correct species. This is just an example for corn. If you can get it planted on time, this here would have to be planted by the end of September down here. You got radishes, vetch, Austin winter peas. Uh, there's some uh, oats in there. You see them big leaves. There's also some triticale in there. So um, in this case right here, I intentionally set it up for corn. I designed this mix, five or six species. And yes, the seeding rates and everything, I try to keep between 20 and $30 an acre. That's just my kind of rule of thumb. And I'll just tell you, that's, that's where most people settle at in that realm. If, there, if there's a reason you can go lower, that's great. If you need to go higher for whatever reason, you know, you gotta do it. That's how this looked late February. Starting to thaw out. You see that the radishes are dead. The oats is dead. There's still some vetch and Austin winter peas. Crimson clover actually was in there too. I forgot to say that. Triticale there in the middle. Here's how it looked on the second week of May up at my place. Beautiful. That's the same, same exact thing. Um, and so now it's time to plant. And so what I did here is I, I did spray, I don't know exactly, let's just say, I'll just say I sprayed glyphosate, I forget the rate, and rolled it. It was tall enough to roll. Anything for corn over 20 inches I'm going to roll. Corn doesn't like shade at all. When it comes out of the ground it has to be pretty open. Soybeans can take some shade. You don't have to roll as, as much for soybeans. So I sprayed this um, with glyphosate and rolled it. No residual. Now this is how it looked a couple weeks later when it came up. No fertilizer yet because no additional fertilizer. But this is the time when I put some more on. Because I have enough legumes in there to grow the corn at this point. And if you look there's a little weed down here. There, you can't see it in the back. No residuals. I did, in all, this, all fairness, I did some post-emergence around the bottom and along the road. Honestly, it was along the road. <laughs> I wanted to make sure there was no weeds. <laughs> Just being honest. Um, so here we are. So we've spent very little money so far. Come harvest time, and, you know, I'm only showing you this picture here, but the field was very clean. I can't do this all the time, but this is, a sh this is ideal. I have other pictures of other scenarios where I have grown corn without residuals. Matter of fact, that's what I try to do now. I try not to use residuals. There's, a, there's plenty of good post-emergence products out there. If we have to, we go out and do it. So that's just where I'm at personally. Um, so in coming up with a mix, generally speaking, and there's a lot of research will back this up. When you start mixing species, there's synergies that occur. And those synergies, I like to say, are one plus one equals three. So that plays in the seeding rates. So there's, there's different types of methods and strategies to figure out what should the seeding rates be in a general mix. So you can take, you know, four species, we'll just say, and you can say, well, I'm just going to plant one quarter of the rates of the normal single species rate. That's a starting point. But what I'm saying is you can take that and reduce it by 10 or 20 percent then because of the synergistic effect. Then that starts helping with your price. The other thing is, is swapping species. Hairy vetch tends to be expensive. The price can go up and down. Crimson clover the same way. All stream but that price can fluctuate. This is why you check with your seed dealer. Sometimes you know, some of you are price shoppers, that's fine. Or just have say, hey, you know, where are things at right now? And, well, price of vetch, well, it's that high? What's crimson clover? Oh, oh, it's that low, okay. Well, let's stack it a little bit. We like vetch, but let's just use a little less vetch and a little more crimson clover. That's how my mind works. Because you gotta pay attention to this stuff um, and how that all works out. And you can name any species you want, but am I getting to your answer yet? You have anything else in that? I just want NRCS to hear this. Well, they did. Okay. He said he wanted NRCS to hear it. Yeah, and, and I, will, I will say sometimes the seeding rates, I mean, some of it is, well, you're getting paid for it. 
So who cares? Sometimes the seeding rates are higher. And you know, the seeding rates are established on something, usually some university data or whatever. I would say this, that typically what most seed dealers are suggesting is on the high side. Well, they're selling seed. Um, now, they have to cover themselves because not every farmer is as tenacious about getting the seeds in the ground right. So if you're drilling or using a precision planter, you're going to have a seeding rate that's going to perform much better than throwing it out of an airplane. It just is. So you have to weigh all this stuff. And that's why I'm an advocate of using precision planters, especially if you have a 15-inch planter and it's before the third week of September. You know, there's plates now you can get to plant mixes and vacuum planters. Um, and and I, I, I got them. I mean, you can, you can do that. Um, so you had a question. Is that what you use when you plant it? Uh, the, 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 uh, this was this was planted by a drill. Yeah, this here. That was a drill. Now, if you remember way, way, way back, I showed that one picture of the 15-inch rows and a nice thin row. That was planted with a precision planter, Kinsey planter. So I have a Kinsey planter. I have both Kinsey brush meters, and I have a whole set of precision planting meters. I have two sets of that because when I got the planter, I was doing a lot of cover crop research and I wanted to research planting with that planter. So that's why the reason I got two set, sets of meters. So there's meters out there now. I should have brought the little ones, but you can get them. So the problem with the normal meter for a vacuum planter is the holes that it's in it to pull the air so the air can suck through and suck up the seed against it are too big and things like crimson clover or annual ryegrass will stick in them. So what some aftermarket companies have done now is they've made, I'll call it bigger pockets, so they can plant a very, very varying rate of seed and they put finer holes, multiple holes in each pocket. Follow me? I wish I would have brought some along because I showed you. But you understand, so we can plant now mixes and you can fine tune that. So you have a precision planter, the seeding depth, you can actually use your row cleaners. I mean, if you're following the combine, that's a lot of residue to get through sometimes. And it's nice, not that you pull everything aside, but you can actually brush away some of the corn to get a better seed to soil contact, you can actually, I will say, you can cut your seeding rates in half by using a precision planter. Now, usually when they get down to 15 inches, by the time the end of September, October rolls around, I want to drill. I want things planted a little closer. Unless the only thing you're trying to do comes back to what are you trying to accomplish. Unless the only thing you're trying to do is to soak up extra nitrogen. You may not need drills. You know, I know some people who actually planted radishes on 30 inch rows. You can, you can, now that's easy. If you're just using radishes, you can get a sugar beet plate or a small Milo plate and you can simulate them regardless of the brush meter, regardless of any vacuum out that's out there. Now, since there's not a lot of sugar beets growing around here, at least I didn't know about it, you might want to talk to your dealer a couple weeks ahead of time. You want what? Yeah, sugar beets. Oh, okay, I'll look in the book. Uh, we'll have them in for you next week. That's again, just some things that you might want to do. Other questions? Yes. Can you, um, can you talk a little bit about your, your inner seeding experience? Yes. In uh, early corn? Or young You're talking corn, about V4? Young, yeah, young corn. Young corn. Um, summary, I would rather plant short season genetics and follow the combine than inner seed. That's generally what we've been finding. The other thing, though, too, is there is a common um, observation that we started a little too late. We used to say V4 to V6. Now we're saying V3 to V4, a little earlier, just to get that cover crop a little more established, and it still won't compete with the corn. You know, if the first question people ask, well, it's going to become a weed. Well, if you think about it, when the corn's V3, this high, if you plant at that time, by the time that seed comes up, that, that corn's, everything's growing, starting to grow quickly. It's V4, V5, or whatever. So it doesn't, it doesn't become a weed, trust me. There's so much data out there on that. It, that's not an issue. What was, your, what was your intention in planting that corn? My intention was planting full season, planting interseeding into full season corn, 112 day corn, 114 day corn that I typically don't harvest till October the 15th. I wanted cover crop to be living in there. Because now we're getting too late. Well, we can still plant rye, but I wanted radishes, crimson clover, hairy vetch, and all that stuff planted in June. To, as soon as the corn starts drying down in September, it starts waking up. 
I mean, it starts getting green underneath there when the leaves fall down. It's all about sunlight. And the thing of it is, is wherever we ran corn down or there was a skipper, that, that the interseeded stuff back at V4 was growing. It's always, it's about sunlight. And even though we looked and it's growing everywhere in July, we lose it in August to dry weather, usually, or lack of sunlight. It just doesn't, it, because, you know, people ask, well, isn't it taking nutrients from the corn? Well, it doesn't seem to. That, we have not seen yield reductions. Overall, we've actually seen a tad bit of yield increases. So I'm just saying, no yield loss. But when you lose the whole stand, you've lost almost everything. So it's much more consistent in northern latitudes. Have you, have you tried it with the intention of feeding the crop or the legume? Feeding the, feeding the, the corn? Crop, yeah, well, crop. <laughs> I hesitated to bring this up, but... Um, I mean, I've heard guys say that you could come in with theoretically thin-run soybeans and use them as a cover crop legume to feed your corn crop. Yeah. And the well, bread. in theory, putting soybeans in the middle there sounds great. Uh, and I've heard some people do it. It just seems like it hasn't caught on. I never tried that exact thing, but that would be kind of nice. You could use Roundup Ready in both and then spread out. It what is this high. You're set for weed control. Hey, maybe that's something you need to try. I, I actually never did that. Um, the problem is, you know, you, want, you don't want to sacrifice your corn population I actually did varying populations just to see if that would work with a flex here. I did it from 23,000 to 36. Now just to give you, a, I, I generally plant 30 to 32. Probably a little more than you guys do here on your sandy soil. But just to give you a spread, I went down to 23,000 and still couldn't get consistent better growth on my cover crop. Because I thought with a flex here, a little less leaf, a little more sun going in there. Theoretically that sounded good. but. It just didn't, and, and other people have done it. Now, what I was hesitating to bring up, and maybe I'll just put it out there, how many of you heard of wide row corn coming back? Like 60 inch corn. Some of you heard of it, you read about it? Well, don't, don't laugh at that too hard, uh, but don't use that tactic to grow the highest corn yield in the neighborhood. Where it is working, and I think I can say this now, last year, there's a fellow by the name of Bob, Bob Recker, R-E-C-K-E-R. -E -E if you're interested in this, look him up, Bob Recker, and you'll see his trials. He did it in like 14 farms across the Midwest and got a 5% yield reduction, which isn't that bad, but what he got was 10 times the amount of biomass of cover crop growth. And that's what I'm saying. That's, that's collecting some other people involved in there. He didn't have cover crops every time. If you have cattle, if you are grazing, it is a no-brainer. You can make up for that 5% yield because as soon as you run the combine through there in a week or two, you can put your cattle out on that. And they have stuff to graze. So if you have cattle, and I know most of you don't here, I personally am not interested in it. But So what they do with 60-inch corn, pretty much, or 45s, they're looking at all kinds of, it's like we're going back to the old days in a way, <clears throat> but you're allowing that other crop to grow. Now, now this kind of, it, it fits into everything I was saying. I'm supporting wide row corn. I don't, haven't really figured out how I can use it though. Uh, if you have cattle, it's a no brainer. Uh, that, that I think, but what they're using is using the same population. So if you're dropping 30,000, you're essentially putting the planter at 60,000 and every other row you don't have any seed in. Um, so, it's, it's kind of fascinating. I would say that's going to take off a little bit in certain areas, but it's certainly not for everyone. So, how are we coming here, Jen? It's 11 o'clock. Okay. Oh, you're first. Uh, going back to the bug issue, uh, haven't you seen that it's more of an issue when a new piece of ground you get that's been degraded and uh -huh. how much you get? soil balance, your base saturation, yeah. calcium, magnesium, yeah. and you get the biology working. Yes. It seems to disappear. It just doesn't seem. It has to usually go after a, a sick plant. A sick plant. Yeah. And if you're, yeah, that's going back, you said education. I think one of the biggest things uh, conservation can do is show us farmers what is a good soil and what isn't. Mm -hmm. We live with degraded soil so long, mm -hmm. we don't know what good soil looks like. Yeah. So, the, so the question is, you pick up a new farm, maybe a new field, 
and it hasn't been treated very well, none of these soil health practices were made, and you're probably going to have more insect pressure and less yields and everything. And that's generally the case. I picked up some land and frankly was surprised. Um, I, I, tr I should have known better. Um, I planted a, um, the, the, the guy that wanted me to farm it, wanted to, he, he said it has to be in hay. So, okay, fine. I got a market for hay in the local area. So it was 20, 20 some acres. And I planted alfalfa and orchard grass as my hay, but I put a nurse crop in there of oats. It's kind of nice, gives you a little more first cutting. It's, it's a, oops, we heard that. <laughs> so um, I planted a field in my farm and I planted this new land. The difference was amazing to me. I should have had 50 more pounds of nitrogen to make that oats grow. That oats was just so lethargic and just nothing there. In my place, it was nice. I mean, I, I didn't put any, I didn't think about it. I didn't put any nitrogen on in the spring. I wasn't, I'm not trying to grow a 100 bushel oat crop here. Just a bushel of oats to be a nurse crop. But where it was a new field, and, and it just, it reinforced to me, wow, this really does work. Um, so that was just an example I had. So to, to answer your question, you get to that point, but it depends on how that field was treated. We really don't know sometimes. And even if the farmer would tell you what he did, it's really what the crop will tell you. And you mentioned about six, sick plants, insects. Uh, another thing out there is, you've all heard this, you know, healthy plants will resist insects more. I definitely think there's some truth to that. And I think we need to be looking into that more. That's, that's where I wish the money would be spent on research now, that kind of stuff. Help us understand this dynamic. Because again, you look at a woods, yeah, there's insects come through. We get gypsy moths come in once in a while and decimate our woods. But generally speaking, we don't have, you don't have to spray fungicides in the fence rows to keep things alive. You don't have to spray insecticides every year just to keep things from being riddled. There are some exceptions. But, you know, it's amazing to me, I, I, and, and this is why my mind goes, you know, I was, I was, uh, I was cutting hay. It was actually, actually in the same field I just told you about. And it was in, it was in um, the end of June, beginning of July. The wild raspberries, which, which are awesome. We have them there in the fence rows. And I'm there picking, they're perfect. They were never sprayed with anything. They're perfect. Why is that? No insects, no insect damage, beautiful, clump, tasty wild raspberries. So that, why is that? I don't have the old answer, but that, there's, it's telling us something, right? That's, that's where I'm at with this whole thing. What, what, do we, what can we learn from that? How can we grow food in a better way? We don't have to depend on all these in, in, inputs. And maybe that's what I should, I should leave you with here today. I don't have all the answers. We don't have all the answers, but this is the direction we're headed. And I hope that today I was able to inspire you in that a little bit, give you a few tips and pointers. We're all learning together, right? And I'm sure next year and years ahead we'll be having different subjects. But thanks for your attention. Appreciate being here again. And uh, I'll hang around here and talk to you some more then. Thanks. <laughs>